Duncan. I'm going to talk about church membership. Thank you. If I can uh, briefly give an uh, advertisement, as you say, uh, my lectures on covenant theology, uh, heavily indebted as they are to uh, Professor McLeod, uh, are available for free on the RTS website. And there is a free ebook uh, available with them. And if you go to rts.edu, you can download and use any of the material. It's in audio format, it's in transcript format, uh, there is a syllabus that can be accessed, and there is an ebook. So you can see what I require for, for assigned reading and utilize that material. And we put it out there for free uh, to just help in the discipleship of the the churches. So if you're interested in following up on that more, I typically have about 28 hours to make my argument on uh, covenant theology as opposed to 50 minutes, and, and that's that's where I do it. And actually, when I got to RTS, uh, they, I, I'm the reason we have a covenant theology course in the curriculum because uh, students were, were having a hard time putting the Bible together. And uh, because of some of the reasons that I was, I was explaining to you before in American evangelicalism. And, and the dean actually came to me and said, I think we need to do a, a, a freestanding course in covenant theology. Um, because though it's touched on in our systematics curriculum, we do not have the number of hours in the systematics curriculum that you have here at the college. And so I want to commend the college for the number of hours that you have in the systematics curriculum. Uh, so now my topic is church membership. And this is one of those topics where contextualization really, really matters. So let me give you a little uh, caveat before we begin. Uh, I am speaking to the issue of church membership out of a distinctly American context. And the, the context that I am speaking out of is one in which there are many, many Christians who do not think that church membership is important or biblical. Uh, there are many uh, fellowships of Christians in the United States that view themselves as churches that deliberately, self-consciously, and principially reject the idea of church membership. Uh, if you have ever heard of the Calvary Chapel churches, uh, Chuck Smith was the longtime leader of that group. They do not have church membership. And uh, the issues in church membership in Scotland and in Scottish Presbyterianism are very, very different. Uh, I know, for instance, many friends who attended uh, Buckley and Greyfriars when I was here and who had attended Buckley and Greyfriars for decades who were adherents but were not members. They had not joined. And there were a variety of reasons why they didn't join. And I understand that that's an even more dramatic problem in some places in the Highlands. And it, uh, it comes from a different theological issue and a different experiential issue than the one I'm talking about. So uh, understand when I say what I'm about to say today is I commend to you uh, a robust idea of church membership. I'm doing it in a context in which church membership is not valued at all, whereas it is entirely possible that you have people that think so highly of what church membership means that it scares them off of it. So just bear that in mind in what I'm saying and, and translate me for me as I speak to you and then feel free to engage with me and disagree with me and uh, probe and question and Criticize, and I'll try and leave enough time this time, finally, for you to do that. I'm, I'm sorry that I've gone so long in each of the times that I've spoken. Uh, I want to take you to Acts chapter 20. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 20 and, and just look at verse 28. I wish we could do the entire chapter and certainly all of Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. But let's look just at verse 28, Acts 20, 28. 
Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Amen. And thus ends this reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May you write its eternal truth upon all our hearts. Much of the New Testament's teaching on the Christian life is unintelligible without an understanding of the importance of church membership. Uh, the one another commands in the New Testament, of which there are many, uh, depend upon a relationship of mutual accountability in a local congregation. That's where those one another commands are especially to be expressed. That doesn't mean that we're not to love our neighbors. It doesn't mean that we're not to love uh, unbelievers. But especially the calls of the one another commands in the New Testament are set in the context of the local congregation. Look at Paul's pastoral exhortation in uh, Philippians chapter 2. What he says there and what he gives the Philippians example passage, the great Christ hymn, in order to do is to address inter- personal, relational problems in the Christian congregation and their selfishness and their pride that is disrupting the life of the congregation is to be corrected in light of Jesus' humiliation. And so he's clearly very concerned for how life works out in the local church. And the passage just wouldn't make sense if there weren't something uh, like church membership, where people are in, gathered in a local congregation and, and have a mutual accountability. And I, I want to say, as we look at this passage, and, and I want to say this to you especially who are preparing for ministry and you're going to be ordained as pastors in the Lord's church, that you uh, are uh, a gift from Christ to the church that he thinks the church needs. And every time we see pastors and elders elected and appointed and ordained, we are witnessing a visible proof that Jesus is reigning at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and ruling the world by his word and spirit. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, the Apostle Paul quotes from the Old Testament and reminds us that when Jesus ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men, among which were apostles, prophets, and pastor teachers. And so pastor teachers are gifts that Jesus gave to the church upon his ascension. So every time you see an ordination service, you are seeing a proof that Jesus is the right hand of God the Father, dispensing, pouring out gifts on his church. And Paul is speaking to a group of these pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders in Ephesus. And as he does so, he explains to us that they are given for various purposes. Let me just mention four of them. They're given for the work of the church. They're given for the growth of the church. They're given for the unity of the church. And they're given for the maturity of the church. And each of these things actually underline the crucial and necessary role of church membership. The things uh, that Paul exhorts these Ephesian pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders to do would not make sense if there was not a congregation in mutual accountability and under their spiritual leadership and authority. So all of the commands that he gives to them actually illuminate what he wants the congregation to do and that the congregation needs to be in mutual accountability to one another and in submission to the leadership of those pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. Just like the author of Hebrews mentions in Hebrews 13, obey your leaders, uh, he says. So let me draw your attention to just a few things here in Acts 20, 
uh, 28, uh, maybe five things in Acts 20 to 28. In Acts 20, verse 17b down to verse 27, Paul urges his own example to the Ephesian elders and he speaks in the declarative mode. But in verse 28, he turns to the imperative. He declares several things to them in the larger context, but in verse 28, he is giving directives. He is giving imperatives. And I want to look at five of those imperatives. The first one is this. Look at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves. Now, he's telling them that as pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders, they are to be spiritual watchmen over themselves. And I think he means not just individually, but collectively. In other words, I think he's not just saying, now, now elder, watch over your own soul. I think he's saying, elders, watch over your own soul and one another's souls. You know, in, in, in the Presbyterian tradition in the United States, and I'm assuming that we gathered, we, we got this from Scotland, you can tell me about the ordination vows uh, of the Free Church and of the larger Scottish tradition afterwards. But we, one of our vows uh, as, as ordinands in the American Presbyterian Church is that we vow to be in submission to our brethren in the Lord. We're, we're required to, uh, to vow that as a part of our ordination um, vow. And uh, I think that points to this call of Paul to be on guard for yourselves, uh, not just individually, but collectively, not just severally, as the old Presbyterians used to say, uh, but jointly, as they used to say. So the very first charge is not for them to keep watch over other people or over the flock, but to keep watch over themselves individually and collectively. It's not merely a call to be an example to people, though he will call on them to be an example to the flock. It is first and foremost a call to have a serious concern for their own salvation, for their own spiritual growth, for their own godliness, their own obedience, and their general Christian walk. A man who does not have concern for his own spiritual condition will be in no spiritual condition to take care of the spiritual condition of others. And Paul is calling on them to watch over themselves. Now, in 1 Timothy 4, 6-16, he sort of plays out for you what that would look like. So if you want to look at how Paul, if somebody said, okay, you want me to watch over myself, Paul, how would I do that? Well, just look at what he says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 6-16, and you'll see a pretty good outline of how a person would go about watching over himself and uh, his fellow elders. Now, one of the reasons this is obviously so important for Paul to say is because of what he says in verse 29. Look at Acts 20, 29. There he says to them, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And then look at verse 30, it gets worse. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. Now, by the way, very often people will point to false teaching in the church and they will say, that proves to me that Christianity is not true. If Christianity were true, God were in charge, you wouldn't have false teaching. It's the exact opposite. If we did not see false teaching in the church, Jesus and Paul would be proved to be untruthful. Both Jesus and Paul told us for certain that we would see false teaching in the church. Seeing false teaching in the church does not call into question the truthfulness of Christianity. It confirms it. Both Jesus and Paul warned about that. But it, now you see why it's so important for Paul to say, keep watch over yourselves. Because false teaching is not just going to come in here from out there. It's going to spring up from within here. What does Calvin say about this passage? It's a, it's a wonderful quote. A man who neglects his own salvation will never be zealous in his concern about the salvation of others. 
And a man who shows, who shows no inclination for godliness will incite others to leave godly lives in vain. A man who forgets about himself will not put out his devotion and effort on the flock, although he himself is part of the flock. So Paul's first exhortation is that they would keep watch over themselves. Now, that very exhortation assumes two things. One, that the congregation is going to experience leadership from people that are keeping watch over themselves. And two, that the congregation itself is going to want to keep, over, uh, keep watch over their own souls. If this is something that elders should do, they will want to do this themselves. Uh, the, the, the congregation will have certain roles to play in encouraging uh, one another. Uh, I, I mentioned to you yesterday my experience of reading all of James Barr over three months and how I was helped. I was helped by a number of things, but one of the things that helped me the most in that time frame is as many questions came into my heart and mind is I went out to an Indian restaurant to eat with two free church uh, young people. Now, they had no idea what I was struggling with, spiritually and intellectually. No idea whatsoever. One of them was a solicitor. One of them was a medical student. And we sat at that Indian restaurant for three hours that night. And we didn't talk about things that were particularly spiritual. <clears throat> but the reality of their Christian experience was so palpable, I could have reached out and touched it. And I, I remember thinking that night, there is no way that these two human beings could be like they are if there was not a Holy Spirit and if he did not indwell them. And thus, that, that, that they didn't even realize they were holding me accountable. <laughs> they didn't even realize that they were helping me keeping watch over their soul, soul, over my soul. But just by being Christians and being in fellowship with me, they actually played a decisive role in keeping me from going over the edge. And so the, if, if, the, if the elders are doing this, it's going to actually encourage the congregation to, to understand the role that we will play in helping one another. Because I said yesterday, we live in a toxic environment for faith. This world is not helping our people believe. It's not at all. And it's, no, it's really no surprise, is it, that so many of them fall away? Well, could a greater understanding of the role that the congregation plays in encouraging the endurance of faith help? Instead of just thinking, oh, the minister will do it. Uh, no, what, they, what these elders do individually and collectively actually provides an example and an encouragement to the congregation to, to be on watch for one another. Uh, I could tell you other testimonies as well of how some of the young people that I met uh, in the free church in the 1980s and early 90s ministered to me in exactly that way in a very profound uh, way. But second, let's, let's rush on. Uh, he goes on to say, be on guard for all the flock. And I'm stopping when, Ivor? One. We'll yeah. <laughs> I'm way past if I'm stopping at 12, right? Um, be on guard for all the flock. So here he says to these pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders, be focused on the task of being concerned for the spiritual needs and welfare of your local body. Be on guard for the flock. Paul calls the elders to watch over, to be on guard for, to be concerned for the spiritual good of the whole flock. Now, of course, that language comes from the language of shepherding, which is common in the Old Testament. It is typical of Jesus. It is typical of Peter, but it's actually very rare in the Apostle Paul, which I think makes it even more striking that he would use that language here. Uh, it's used constantly in the Old Testament and elsewhere in the New Testament, but rather unusually in Paul. And this charge, this imperative, is designed to spur the pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders on in giving deliberate attention to the spiritual condition of the congregation. Are they trusting Christ? Do they understand the gospel? 
Could they explain the gospel if you ask them to explain the gospel? Are they good witnesses to Christ in their testimony and in the way they live? Have they fallen into gross moral problems? Have they embraced false teaching? Are they growing in grace? Do they understand the means of grace and how the means of grace help them grow in the Christian life? Are they faithful in attendance? So many problems in the Christian life begin with non-attendance or with irregular attendance. I don't know how it is for you, but in the United States over the last 20 years, I have found faithful church members more and more irregular in their attendance. Uh, and actually about five years ago, I got up one Sunday and it was a football weekend. Now that's American football. And college football in America is a religion. And people go away for whole weekends uh, and, and, and for the Lord's Day and don't come back till Sunday night from these big events. And uh, I, I got up one football Sunday when both of the major state schools were playing on the Saturday before. And I looked out and the congregation was so empty. I, I, looked, I said, I said, have you gotten tired of me? <laughs> you know, is there, you know, is it time for me to, is it time for me to go? But the, that irregularity, I don't know whether you see that in this culture, but irregularity in church attendance is, is, um, is almost epidemic in evangelical circles in the United States. Partly that's socioeconomic. People have more money and they have the freedom to go. And they have beach houses and they have cabins and they're going off on holidays and sometimes you won't see them for weeks and weeks at a time. And yet all the while, they'll send in their check to support the work of the church and they'll view themselves as faithful members, but they won't be under the word of God Lord's Day after Lord's Day. Non-attendance fuels a lot of other problems in the Christian life. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's all I can do to get to the next Lord's Day. I, I cannot wait for it to come because I need it so desperately. And our people really do need to feel a little bit of desperation. That if I can just get to hear the minister pray the pastoral prayer. If I can just get to hear the word read. If I can just get there to sing the, the Bible with the people of God and to hear it um, expounded, I can make it. Needs to be more of our attitude. But we ask, are they faithful in church attendance? Are they fulfilling their membership vows? Are they committed to the work and worship of the church? These are the kinds of things that elders concerned about the spiritual welfare of the body will give attention to. Now, what does that assume? It assumes that that's what church members do. If, if, if elders are supposed to be looking over church members to do those things then that's what church members are supposed to do. Those things are very important for the living of the Christian life. So every command to pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders in the New Testament actually assumes a corresponding responsibility on the part of the flock, on the part of Christians. And it, so again, it shows us how important church membership is. Third, um, Paul says, look at this in verse 28, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In other words, Paul is saying that elders were invented by God and called and appointed by him for the well-being of his own dear church. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, Paul knows that the elders have been chosen by the people. Uh, that's the way it was from the beginning in the Christian church. But he wants them to be keenly conscious that the choice of the people is only the proximate origin of their call. Ultimately, they've been appointed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has made them pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. God himself, God the Holy Spirit, is the one who has created their office and their work, and he has called them to it. Now, Paul himself may well have trained and ordained most of these men. And yet he says that it is the Holy Spirit that has made them overseers. And I, that's what I want to say to you, those of you who are going into the pastoral ministry, it's God who has called you. It's God who's called you into that work. And you will need to remember that sometimes because you will want to quit. And there will be many things that embarrass and 
humiliate you uh, in the ministry. Some of the people that you love the most will betray you. Uh, people that you've worked really hard for will abandon the faith. Uh, you'll face deep disappointments in the church. But let me, can I, can I say this? Don't give way to cynicism. Cynicism is easy to come about with in the Christian life and in the Christian church, um, but it's not a plan. Cynicism is not a plan. Uh, we, we, all of us as <clears throat> pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders, need to breathe the air of hope constantly because it is very easy to be discouraged in the church because the church is a mess. And, and we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, at, as, as Augustine said, it's a hospital where sick sinners get well. And so we shouldn't be surprised that it looks like a triage sometimes. And the emergency room is completely overloaded. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're kind of overwhelmed by what we have to do. Uh, but don't give way to cynicism. Breathe the air of hope. And remember that it's God who has called you. Again, listen to what Calvin says about this passage. The care of the church has been committed <clears throat> to your charge by God. Accordingly, greater conscientiousness is demanded from, the, from them, these elders. Because there is going to be a, diff a difficult reckoning before the supreme judgment seat. Although the Lord intended the ministers of God to be chosen from the beginning by the votes of men, nevertheless, he always arrogates the direction of the church to himself, not only so that we may acknowledge him as its one and only governor, but also that we may know that the incomparable treasure of salvation comes only from him. For he is cheated of his glory if we think that the salvation uh, or that the gospel is given to us either by chance or by the will or activity of men. And so Paul, uh, Paul's words prompt Calvin to say that we need to remember that we have been given our charge by God and we will give an account to him. Are you familiar with John Brown's letter to the young minister from the 19th century? There's a young man who's received a small charge out of the college and He's embarrassed by it because he's a young man of some ability and he's got a very small congregation to minister to. And, and John Brown writes him a letter and he says, I know that you are humiliated by the size of your flock, but on the day that you are standing with them before the judgment seat, you will say, it was enough. And he's just reminding that pastor, teacher, shepherd, elder that he's got an accountable uh, he's got an accountability to God in his ministry to them before the judgment seat because God has appointed him as an overseer. That's the third thing I want you to see. Fourth, now, now again, the, the, the implication of that for church membership, again, is that if God has appointed elders for that oversight, we must need that oversight as church members. God doesn't give us gifts that we don't need. And so we must need that kind of oversight uh, if God gives it. That's, Paul, that's, uh, I, that's um, Calvin's argument as he expounds Isaiah 7. You remember he's looking at the passage when the king has rejected the sign that Isaiah offers him. I'll give you a sign. Make it as high as the heaven or as low as the depths of the earth. And the king says, no, I'm not going to tempt God by asking for a sign. And Calvin says that was not pious for him to reject a sign because God offered him a sign because he needed it. And rejecting the sign was not an act of faith. It was an act of unbelief because if God offers you something, you need it. And so you better accept it. And Calvin then applies that to the sacraments. But it's also true to church government. If God gives you something, you need it. And so church members need to know that. Here's the fourth thing. Verse 28 again. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. That is, Paul is saying that pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders are called to the work of overseeing, of pastoring, of guarding, of protecting and feeding. Um, in verse 17, these people are called elders, presbyteroi. Here, the elders are given a directive 
to shepherd or guard or to protect. Uh, the presbyteroi are to be episcopoi. So presbyter and bishop are not two different offices. There's a sense in which the title is presbyter, the function is to bishop. It's, it's almost like bishop is a verb. Presbyter is bishop. That's what they do. They, they guard, they pastor, they shepherd, they, they guide, they protect, they feed. And that pattern, of course, of the, of the correspondence between that terminology is that way everywhere in the New Testament. Uh, you'll find it in every part of the New Testament, that correspondence between the work of the presbyter or elder uh, in pastoring or being a bishop. And so, just in case you missed it, Paul repeats himself. He says, elders are shepherds of God's church. And they are to show loving care and concern for the spiritual well-being of the whole body. They are to desire and work for salvation, sanctification, and service in the congregation. And they are overseers. They're not taskmasters. They're not foremen. Uh, they're, they're guardians, they're watchmen, they're protectors. They're there for the benefit of the people. Uh, they're there for their well-being. They're called to guide and direct and protect and feed and help the flock of God. And so, again, if God has created a special group of people to do that in his church, what do church members need to know? Well, I must need that. I must need that in my life. That must be an essential part of discipleship. So that just like Jesus said, and I, we, we, we've had some wonderful conversations. I had a conversation about this with uh, John McIntosh this morning. I had a conversation about this at lunch today. In our day and age, there is a tendency to divide evangelism and discipleship. But please, please look at the Great Commission again. The Great Commission is a call not to evangelize the nation, but, but to disciple. Go make disciples. In other words, you can't evangelize without discipling. A decision does not make a disciple. Jesus says the way you make a disciple is what? Baptizing and teaching. That's how you make a disciple. In other words, what is Jesus saying? You need a local body of believers to make a disciple. That's where you baptize them. That's where you teach them. That's where they live out the one another commands. And that's how they do what in the Great Commission? Obey all that I have commanded you. Not teach them an easy ABC outline of the gospel, but teach them not only to know all that I have commanded you, but to do all that I commanded you. It's back to Jesus' hearers and doers language at the end of Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's how the disciples are to go about doing evangelism and discipleship together. Those things go together. They shouldn't be separated. We really, really need to make sure that our evangelism does not compromise discipleship in the church today. Does not undermine discipleship. And what Paul is saying here to the elders assumes that this kind of the discipleship is something that the flock in the local body needs. And then finally, look at the very last phrase. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I know that there are both textual and interpretive challenges in that phrase, and I won't get into it in detail, but let me just summarize what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that elders, these pastor, teacher, shepherd elders, have been entrusted with God's own inheritance, purchased by the blood of his son. And what he is doing is he is reminding the elders of the exceeding preciousness of the people whom he has called them to pastor. God, Paul, in other words, is saying God himself has redeemed, purchased, paid for his people, his church, his vineyard, his son's body, his children, all the metaphors that God uses for the people of God in the scriptures. And this has been done through the infinite cost of the death and dereliction of his own son. And surely it is a serious and a sober thing to be entrusted with such a great gift. You know, if, if, a college, if you were dying and you had children still in the home and you said to a friend, would you, would you help 
with the rearing of my children. That friend would feel an enormous burden because of his love for you and your love for him in helping your widow rear those children. Sort of, you know, being in a father, being a father to the girls or being a dad to the boys. You'd feel an enormous burden. I've seen that happen in the Christian life where a man has died and then friends have come alongside and tried to be a dad to the sons and to the, and to the fathers. And there's an enormous sense of burden uh, and, and obligation uh, to such a precious gift. Well, God has entrusted you, if you're a pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders, with people that have been bought by the price of the blood of his own son. There's nothing more precious in the world uh, to be given by God. And that reality, uh, when you realize the exceeding preciousness to God of what he has given into your arms to care for, will influence the way you go about the work. And how does that play out for the members themselves. Well, first of all, they must know how precious they are to God if God would give such a precious gift. They are exceedingly precious to God. You know, there's, there's this play on words, by the way, in both the Old Testament and the New, with the language of inheritance. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's inheritance is talked about in two ways. And you see it in Ephesians chapter 1, by the way. You also see it in uh, Old Testament Exodus passages. Um, we both have an inheritance and we are an inheritance as the people of God. God has given us an inheritance. That's an Old T Testament theme. And uh, what is the inheritance that God has given us? Himself, ultimately. And uh, we are an inheritance. Meaning what? We are God what God has chosen for his inheritance. And that's played out in Ephesians chapter 1 as well, isn't it? When Paul talks about the themes of the inheritance that we have from God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you ask the question, what is it that God gets out of redemption? I know what I get out of redemption. I get rescue from hell. I get justification, the pardon of all my sins and the acceptance of my person, not because of anything in me, but because of Christ alone. I get sanctification, where more and more I die to sin and more and more I live to, to righteousness in Christ. I'll get glorification. I can name you all the things I get, but what does God get? And the biblical answer that we get from the doctrine of the inheritance of God is you. That's what God gets out of redemption. You. That's what he wants. Yes, it would be right to say he gets glory. And the New Testament emphasizes that. And the Old Testament emphasizes that. He gets glory. The sovereignty of his mercy is displayed in redemption. And he gets glory. But over and over he says, this is I want you in fellowship with me. I want you in communion with me. Not because I couldn't have communion and fellowship without you. I've had communion and fellowship eternally in the blessed relations of the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, <laughs> ever loving one another. But I want you, and remember Jesus' high priestly prayer. If I said what I'm about to say without Jesus having said it, you could burn me at the stake as a heretic. The high priestly prayer prays that you will experience the same love that he has experienced from his heavenly Father. That you would be caught up into that communion and fellowship of love. Why? Because you're what God has chosen. Now, when, when a congregation understands that, it helps a congregation be sympathetic to the enormous responsibility that has been given to the pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. You've been entrusted with the most precious thing in this world to God. His people bought at the price of the most precious thing in the universe, his son. I better pray for you, that congregation member says. And then that congregation member says, if God so cares for me, 
that he's given his own son. And he's given me these elders and teachers and pastors and shepherds. I must really need this for my Christian life. And again, this passage and the imperatives that are given to the leaders of God's people, actually there's a mirror reflection of the importance of being a part of God's people in the local congregation. And so I want to commend to you in the context where you may have other battles to fight, where there are people who won't join the church because maybe they think they're not worthy <coughs> or for some other reason. Uh, we still want people to know what a blessed thing fellowship and life in the local congregation is and how important it is and what a benefit it is for their Christian life. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize how much I need God's people. I know that God's people can let you down. I know that friends can betray you. I understand that. I've experienced that myself. And sadly, I've let God's people down. That's why we have to repent. But by and large, I must say, my experience in the churches has been overwhelmingly positive. I sometimes feel embarrassed around other people who have had horror stories in the life of the local congregation because by and large, every experience I have had since childhood in every church that I've ever been has been nourishing to me. And it's my prayer that more people would experience that and thus would appreciate the importance of belonging in that local body. Thank you. Thank you for a very comprehensive lecture. Thank you so much. Um, questions? What would you say to people who would say, well, I can still experience that being in church without becoming a member? So my experience is a lot of people don't want to become members because I think they don't want to be tied into the structure. They don't want to be committed. Um, they don't, you know, Christianity, I think for a lot of people, about their own personal experience, they want to have this ruling body over them. Right. But they still like the church, they still like coming to church. Right. It's really hard to convince them that actually being a member is, is a really good thing. Well, that's, that's a great question. I think you've put your finger right on it. And if, let me just indict the American scene. I don't know the scene here. I was a, I was a very welcomed and blessed visitor here for four years. And I learned a lot, but I, don't, I, had, I didn't learn enough to dare counsel you on the specifics of your situation. But in America, among younger folk that I was talking about being so excited about yesterday, and I really am, I do see a real struggle with a lack of commitment. They, young, young people in America have so many options before them, they want to keep their options open. And they are allergic to commitment. And that is precisely what they get out of church membership, is you learn how to commit yourself. You know, if you, if you try and get married and keep your option open, it's not going to go well. I can promise you. You get married and you try and keep your options open, it's not going to end, it's not going to be pretty. And it's the same way in the Christian life. You know, the, the, it's making a commitment, partly, I think, in America, there's a, we want to have it all in the local church. You know, we want our local church to have John Piper preaching and uh, Sinclair Ferguson uh, doing the discipleship and, uh, you know, all the bells and whistles and all the, the resources, etc. We, we want it all in our local church of 96 people. And, uh, and, and because there is so much because of electronic media and the wonders of the World Wide Web and social media, there is such a greater awareness of the resources that are out there in the Christian world. People can be somewhat dissatisfied with the weaknesses of their local congregation. And I think we have to explain to them the joys and the glory of being in a local congregation where John Piper is not a morning preacher or, you know, fill in your favorite uh, preacher. 
in, in the blank and, and how it is that life in that local congregation, it's not that it won't benefit them to listen to resources online or to read books in the Christian life, but there are things that happen when the congregation is gathered under the word uh, as God dispenses his means of grace that happen nowhere else in the world. And I, I try and remind, uh, on every element of the, of the worship service, I try to remind people of, of that because we take that for granted. Like, for instance, before I read the Bible, every once in a while, in a, in a morning or an evening service, I'll, I'll pause before I read the Bible and I say, I'm about to do something and you're about to hear something that uh, five billion people on this planet have never heard. The Word of God read in a worship service of the church publicly as a means of grace. There are five billion people on this planet in your own language. There are five billion people on this planet that have never ever experienced that. It's an enormous privilege to have that. And you don't have to have the most exciting preacher in the world for that to happen in the local congregation. Or the pastoral prayer. I try and emphasize that in the same way. Did I tell you my pastoral prayer story yesterday? I'm at the door of a church and a young woman comes to me in tears. And what's every preacher thinking? Oh, I hope my sermon really you know, ministered to her. Well, she came up to me and it wasn't about me or my sermon at all. Derek Thomas was assisting me in the service that day and he had prayed the prayer. He had prayed the long prayer, the pastoral prayer. And she said to me, with tears in her eyes, what was that that he did in the middle of the service? And I said, I was sort of, what did Derek do in the middle of the service? I mean, you mean the long prayer that he prayed? Yes, that. Well, that's the pastoral prayer. Every week, our pastor prays for our congregation and for other Bible-believing congregations in the church and in the world and intercedes for individual Christians about various things. We do that every week. She said, I've never heard this before. Well, I got all excited because I thought, I have not only met a non-Christian, I've met a non-Christian that's not only unchurched, she's never been in a church before because she'll have heard a pastoral prayer if she'd ever been in church before. And uh, I said, well, so you must not go to church. Oh, no, I'm in church every Lord's Day. This is my first time at First Presbyterian, but I've, I'm in church every Lord's Day. And I said, oh, well, so you must not have grown up in church. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a pastor's daughter. <laughs> really? Tell me about your church. A Pentecostal church where there is no prayer in the worship service. None. And she had never heard a pastoral prayer in her life. And it struck me that day, I've been taking for granted the pastoral prayer. And so I started telling my, I, I, I relayed that story when she was not there one Sunday. I just told the story of someone telling me that they had never heard the minister intercede for the people and storm the gates of heaven at the throne of grace, interceding for God's uh, people and how important and significant that is and how I wanted them to think if I can just get to the next pastoral prayer, I can make it. If I can just get there to hear the minister <coughs> pray that pastoral prayer. And it really, it, it, it spurred, I've always loved the pastoral prayer and I've worked hard to prepare for it. But it just made me love it more and realize how, how important it was because sometimes you wonder how closely the people are following you in the pastoral prayer. I, I must admit, when I first got to First Presbyterian Church, people were clocking me on the pastoral prayer. They were clocking me on the pastoral prayer. That's an indictment of me. I remember one of my professors saying, son, long prayers are for the closet. Um, and so I, I, learned, I learned out of that. But I, 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 did, I, I do think that we underestimate the importance of things like that. And that can happen in any and every local church. It doesn't have to happen with a church with all the, the resources. And so we need to explain to people the benefit of that commitment that we're asking them to make. It's going to bless them to make that commitment, even though there are going to be things that they don't like uh, about that church, even though there will be other churches that have other things. And I see American young people sort of church hopping. They go from place to place to place to place, and they find good things in each place, and they don't want to give up any of those good things, so they don't commit to any of them. And I think that is one of the things that cuts people loose from Christianity when they get into the middle years of life. 
because they've never ever learned what it is to commit as young people. And then you get lost along the way because if you're in a local congregation and you suddenly go missing for four weeks, somebody's going to notice. But if you're moving through five churches and you're only seen once every five or six weeks and you don't go to church for four weeks, nobody's ever going to know. And you may never go to church again if you don't go to church for four weeks. And so I think that commitment is really, really important in our culture. We need one another. God said we need one another. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Can I ask a sort of double barrel question which relates partly to this bit this question I've been lecturing now and previous one? Uh, your, your time in Scotland is basically spent in terms of worship in the free church. Yes. Uh, the first part of it is what do you think were the particular benefits or the secrets or whatever mm. you sit, saw in the free church? That's really and, good. And perhaps to some extent, I'm really happy yes. have some to do and still see. The second one uh, relates to uh, the implications of covenant theology. Mm. Uh, I've always been particularly interested in the all age Sunday school movement or whatever you want to call it in the States, which seems to be anathema here. Would you, to what extent would you agree that the All Age Sunday School is a place where you actually have the opportunity to develop covenantal responsibilities mm. to parents, uh, which may well have the benefit of keeping more of our covenantal kids mm. in the church? Mm. That's good. That's really good. Oh, I'm not sure my answer to the second part will be as clear as the answer to the first one. I can, I can go on and on about what I learned um, in worship at the Free Church. What I, just a little bit about me. I, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, a conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing Presbyterian church. Good, solid, reformed preaching of the sort that you would have been comfortable with among the best of your preachers here. So zero complaints about the kind of preaching. The the um, the kind of, of worship that I grew up with uh, would have been um, hymn singing, instrumentally accompanied uh, singing, uh, with only a few psalms here and there. You know, with really the twenty third psalm and maybe Psalm one hundred and Psalm one hundred three, and just a very few psalms still in the vocabulary of, of, the, of, the, of the people of God and with a real emphasis on choirs and special music we tend to call it. And I, I can remember at Baclue, as and my mother was a choir director, so I had grown up singing in the choir and I do love music and I love to sing and I, I love to sing all sorts of, of uh, I, I was classically trained and so a lot of the music that I was used to singing was, you know, it was English choral music and older music and such. But when I got to Baclue, I remember the, the very first Sunday uh, singing the Psalms unaccompanied, thinking to myself, you know what? If any worship is going to happen today, there's going to be nobody here to do it for me. I'm, I'm going to have to do it for myself because I realized then that I could actually be on autopilot in, um, in, a, in a Christian service of worship in a Presbyterian church in the United States and the whole service almost except for the prayer and the preaching is filled with music and instrumental music in particular. There's almost no silence in an American uh, instrumental worship service. And I realized that that actually allows you to depend upon somebody else to worship for you and sort of to retreat into your own world and kind of think about what you want to think about. And I was struck, the, the starkness of the service bolted me into the realization, okay, I better engage here, you know, if, in the prayer, in the singing, I've got to engage actively. That's one of the things that struck me immediately. Um, I also, as a, as a man who's had to prepare church bulletins for years, I have often thought to myself in the midst of the three-day process of preparing a church bulletin, oh, to be a minister in the free church. <laughs> Where I show up 
you know, and I scratch out a few songs and hand it to the presenter, and I'm done. <laughs> I'm liberated. I can spend all that time on very the message. So I, I have all sorts of thoughts about my experience. My experience in, in free church worship, again, was entirely positive. I, I understand and have tried to keep up with some of the debates that have gone on in the last 10 years. But as an American hymn singer, uh, the acquisition of the Psalms has been one of the most spiritually decisive things in my life. And it will be a great loss if there is not a deliberate effort to include the psalmody of the church into the public worship and the private devotions of the free church going forward. It will be an inestimable loss. And the one problem with, with and, and I, there, there's wonderful hymnody. I've tried to study hymnody all my life. And many of the free church fathers wrote wonderful things that were became used in, in public worship later on. They probably didn't mean them for that except for private devotion when they wrote them. And so I love that material. But what tends to happen is that tends to proliferate and the Psalms tend to be excluded. And, um, you know, I, I heard in the preaching of free church ministers uh, metrical phrases from metrical psalms rolled off their lips and out of their hearts and minds second hand. That will be lost in a generation unless there's not a focus on retaining robust psalmody. Um, and, and so that, that would be one thing that I, I would hope would not be lost to the rest of the Presbyterian world uh, because it, it has been in America so much. You know, the, the, the Covenanters in America, the RPCNA, have a robust psalm singing tradition. And um, some of the ARPs, sort of a, an amalgamation of original secession folks, uh, the Erskine folks when they came over to Virginia, they've retained in some of their churches a psalm singing tradition. But psalm singing has been lost in America. And that it really enriched me to experience that here. Now, on the second part, uh, all-age Sunday school, um, you know, Sunday school started in the United States as an evangelistic outreach to unchurched children, and it sort of morphed over time. And in our congregation, it, it has functioned mostly in the area of fostering community and doing sort of detailed teaching discipleship. And I do think that throwing the ages together um, in a in a in a, uh, a smaller, more intimate setting, um, promotes people mixing intergenerationally, and I I always appreciated that as a boy growing up, uh, because I there were older men with whom I had nothing in common that were with me in that setting, and I, I would always think to myself, you know, that that man is a businessman. He doesn't know I'm a 13 year old. He doesn't know what I care about, what I think. But he thinks it's important enough to spend time with me on Sunday before church so that I believe these things. And that, that in and of itself said to me, God is important, the Bible is important, these truths are important. And I'm not sure I remember very much from those days, frankly. But I do remember those things, and I do think it helps intergenerational. 